this is Mr. Yeager uh, looking over the uh, very first unit that we work on in physics and in AP physics. Um, and that is the idea of kinematics. All right. When we start physics, the first thing we're interested in doing is describing motion. And that's what kinematics really is talking about. So we start off as simple as possible and we're going to look at what's called 1D motion, which just means obviously you're moving in a straight line, either forward or back or up or down. Okay. That's where this is basically working at. So again, we're going to look at trying to describe. Okay. Now, this is a very, very large topic. Basically, this is the introduction to what's called mechanical physics, which is really what this course is about. All right. And again, it's the study of motion of the objects. We'll obviously get more and more specific with the motion of the objects as we continue to move through this course. But again, we want to start off with just simply how are we going to describe how an object moves. All right. But this is a this is an entire semester, I mean, like an entire year course in college. Mechanical physics is an entire semester course of physics. All right. So there's going to be a lot of vocabulary in this section, a lot of things that we need to start understanding and using. Um, a lot of these words you might have heard of before, but at the same time, a lot of people don't use them completely correctly. So we got scalars and vectors. We got distance displacement, speed. Where we're going to talk about instantaneous and average. Uh, average velocity, and then acceleration. Okay. So kinematics itself, as I already said, is a, is basically how we describe the motion. We're not interested in why it's occurring or how it's going to change. Simply, we're going to just describe what is happening, okay, or what could be happening in terms of what we know about the motion of the object. Again, not interested in why it's occurring, why it's doing what it's doing, why will it change, that's more or less for when we get to forces. Okay. And so again, we're looking at what's called one-dimensional kinematics, movement in a straight line. Later on, we're going to look at two-dimensional kinematics, which is projectile motion, uh, motion along a basically a parabola. All right. So the first big question I always ask, and if I'm in the classroom, I try to illustrate this, is how do you know an object is moving? Okay. How do you know an object is in motion? Okay. And basically the answer to that is it, the object has changed its position. All right. That's what motion is. Motion is a change in position. Okay. It's not where it was. All right. Now again, this can be a little bit misleading. Okay. You, what I do in the classroom is I go, okay, everybody look at me. Close your eyes. You know, I take two steps to the left and I say, open. I go, did I move? And obviously the idea what they would say is yes. Did they see me move? No. But the idea is I'm not at where I was, so I must have created some sort of motion. Now this can obviously be, like I said, deceiving because I could be where I am, tell everybody to close their eyes, run around the classroom and come back exactly to where I am, and I go, did I move? In that case, they can't necessarily say I moved. A lot of them then go, well, I heard you move. But again, we're going to go off of sight. Did you see it happen? Did you see it change position? Okay. Or is it in a new position than where it was? Okay. An object can't just be in a new spot without some sort of motion occurring. All right. So we say motion is relative. And this is very, very tricky, kind of an early on thing. What we are saying is it's all based on your point of view. It based, it's depending on what you are doing. So motion is measured in reference to another object or point. Okay? There's something around the room that you see. All right? Obviously, if, that, if you have an object and it's changed its spot in relation to where it was, in relation, relative to where it was, there must have been motion. So we call this your frame of reference. Your frame of reference. Basically saying, again, where are you? In a classroom, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> As I walk toward the back, some people see me walking toward them, others see me walking away. That's what we're talking about, your frame of reference. All right. Uh, in terms of my frame of reference, when I walk to the left, and I think I'm walking to the left, everybody looking straight at me thinks I'm walking to the right. All right. So that's what we're looking at in terms of, again, what we mean by motion is relative. All right. One last example, you're sitting in a car going 60 miles an hour. All right. How fast are you moving in relation to the car? The answer is zero. You are sitting in the car. You're not moving any faster or slower than the car. 
What are you moving in relation to? That would be the ground. All right, you're moving 60 miles per hour over the ground. All right, and so that's where again this gets tricky. We got to be paying attention. What is the reference point? All right, it's sort of what Einstein gets into with his theory of relativity, but we're not going to talk about that now. So again, I mean, this is just some examples here. Are you moving in relation, if you have these two students sitting in this, are they moving relative to each other? The answer would be no, okay? They are not. If they're sitting directly in the desk, they are not moving. If one person doesn't think the other person is moving. Are they moving relative to the solar system? This is obviously very, very, I, I mean, it's an abstract thought, but it's happening. Are you moving in the solar system right now? The answer is yes, because the Earth is rotating around the sun. All right. Technically, you're spinning in place. You're spinning around the center of the Earth the whole time, All right, rotating around the sun. So again, this is kind of the initial tough thing to kind of move over and go, what does he mean by relative frame of reference? It's your point of view. What you believe, what you see happening might be different from what other people see happening around you. It's your frame of reference. Okay. There are two people. One is sitting in the train and one is outside the train. The person in the train is not moving relative to the train. He is sitting. The person in the train is moving relative to the ground because the train is moving over the ground. That was my car example. Okay. So that's kind of the initial, like, what is motion? Motion means an object has changed its position based on your frame of reference, based on your frame of reference. So what about some other terms here? We're going to be talking a lot about vectors and scalars. This will be something that we talk about quite a bit, and then it'll kind of just keep on popping up intermittently throughout the year, saying this is a vector, this is a scalar quantity. So what you have are these are two types of measurements. The first basic thing to think about is these are two types of measurements. All right, they, there's similarities between them, and then there's a big difference. The first type of measurement we have out there are called vector measurements, vector quantities. This is going to be anything that we measure that has not only a size or magnitude or number, okay, like 10 miles per hour, that would be a magnitude, okay? but it also has direction. So vectors are what we say as magnitude and direction. All right. So what we mean by that is I'm going 10 miles per hour. That's only telling you that I'm going that fast, but do you know which way I'm going? No. If I want to make it a vector quantity, I would say 10 miles per hour east, 10 miles per hour left, up, down, whatever you want to say. We just have to add some sort of direction. We'll be able to represent vectors with arrows because we like to show exactly in a diagram which way an object is moving. It will help us understand what's going on. Okay. Right. This I'm not so worried about. Technically, the length of a vector should be proportional to the magnitude. Basically, the idea is you do create, if you want to draw out the arrows, Obviously, if it's a greater magnitude, we should draw a longer arrow, okay? But this is something that, again, we will scale. We really don't worry about this too much. It's more of when you actually see it in a picture or on a test, obviously the longer arrow must mean that it has a greater force on it, a greater magnitude, okay? Or, sorry, not necessarily force, but greater speed or whatever all these other terms we're going to use that are vectors, okay? Scalars, on the other hand, are simply a number value a magnitude, a numerical value. Nothing else is given. So when I said I'm going 10 miles an hour, that's a scalar quantity that I'm giving you. Because again, it's just telling you how fast, but it doesn't tell you where. Okay? So scalars don't give up, they give that much uh, information. Okay? But some things just happen to be scalar. Some things don't have direction. Like time, there is no, hey, I'm walking 10 seconds to the right. You'd be going, wait, what? 10 seconds right? That doesn't mean anything. Time is obviously, it doesn't matter which direction you are, so time would be an example of a scalar quantity. But the one I have down below is also an example where I just said the room is three meters from the ceiling to the floor. That doesn't tell you any which direction. It could be three meters down or three meters up, all right? It's just saying that it's a distance, how tall, okay? 
Again, scalars don't give that much information. It would be, again, like somebody's telling you, go two miles and then go four miles and go six miles, and you're going, wait, which way am I going to get to your house? That could be anywhere. Okay. All right, so let's put these scalars into form. Let's actually start using some of these actual terms we'll use with motion. And again, some of these you know. The first one is distance. Distance itself does not need a frame of reference, okay? It is simply the how far apart or the separation between two points, all right? It is not a direction, therefore it's a scalar value. Distance is the scalar quantity saying how far something is. How far, all right? That's it. It'll be measured, the SI unit for it is meters, but it could be kilometers, it could be miles, it could be centimeters. Obviously in physics we use metrics, so it'll be meters, kilometers, centimeters most likely, most of the time. But again, you know, I take trips, I, I take trips over the summer, I'm sure you do too. I don't go, hey, I traveled 700 miles. I know some people say that. You know, I traveled 700 miles this year. People go, okay, where? Well, I can't tell you that, I only want to keep it scalar. Okay? You know, obviously we want to make it clear where you go, you should obviously describe which direction you have gone. Okay? Or obviously I could relate it to a map. But if I just say how far it is, that is distance and that is only a scalar quantity. Okay? The vector quantity we call displacement. And this is the one we will use more often when we do calculations. All right? Displacement, delta D or in AP physics, delta X, okay, delta X. These are, you're going to see I use this pretty interchangeably. You're going to have to get used to it, all right? They both basically mean the same thing. In an AP class, we try to say X. That's the, that's the letter that we use for displacement in all of our formulas. So what is displacement specifically, all right? There's a couple of ways we can describe it. One is just simply how far are you from home, okay? So you take this whole trip, you go all different directions, how far are you from home? How far are you from your starting point? Okay, that is what displacement means. How far you are from your starting point. All right, it is a change in position, so it's like, wait, why do I have to use a different term other than distance? That's because the displacement is not only the magnitude or distance that the object travels, but also the direction you are from your starting point from your starting point. So it is a vector quantity. This is the vector quantity for distance called displacement. All right? And we will express the direction with a sign or direction. Okay? So we will specifically say you go 45 meters to the north. This is now, this whole thing is now a displacement. It's telling me exactly how far I am from where I started. Okay? If I just said I went 45 meters, that would be distance, all right? Then you want to know, did I go north, south, east, or west? So displacement is more specific. This is going to be very important. The sign. This is the other way that we like to try to show chain, or the direction, okay? We will use positive and negative to represent a direction. What is positive? It doesn't matter. You can pick it. Positive can mean right, and negative can mean left. Positive can mean up, and Negative would be down. They just simply mean opposite directions to each other. All right, based on what, you, like, based on again your frame of reference. So if I travel positive 82 centimeters and somebody else goes negative 82 centimeters, if I said how, which one went farther? Which one went farther? The answer would be neither. They both go the same distance. They both travel the same distance, okay? But did they move the same? No. Positive means one went to the right. Negative means one went to the left, 82, all right? An example I try to put with this is like if I have two students up front, I have them back to back, I say both of you guys take two steps. They take two steps. I go, which one took more steps? The answer is neither. They took the same amount of steps. They went the same distance. But the thing is if they're back to back and walk straight ahead, then obviously one went two steps to the right, one went two steps to the left. And so I would say positive two steps, negative two steps. Okay. Oh, I 
want to go back to something with displacement. So with displacement, we said how far are you from home? Okay. So if I use my diagram down here, I start at A. I'm going to go 4 meters to the right to B. 4 meters right, that would be a vector quantity. Distance would be 4 meters. Then I go 2 meters down. Okay. Well now how far have I traveled? Give me the distance. It would be 4 plus 2. I've gone a total of 6 meters. But this is where it's going to be a little complicated. What's my displacement? My displacement would be the hypotenuse. It would be the diagonal across it because that's the measurement of how far I am from home. I'm not 6 meters from home. I'm a, basically a combination of the two using Pythagorean theorem. Let's say I go 4 meters back to the left. So I've gone right 4, down 2, back to the left. Now I'm at D. What distance did I travel? My distance would be uh, 10 meters. 4 plus 2 plus 4. My displacement would be 2 meters south. Because that's how far I am from home. I'm 2 meters south. That's what I've, that's, how, that's my displacement. Okay? I know it's getting confusing. What if I go 4 meters to the right, 2 meters down, 4 meters to the left, and 2 meters back to A? Well, my distance would be 12 meters. I, distance just keeps on adding up. Distance is like an odometer on your, on your car. It just keeps on increasing. But what's my displacement? How far am I from my starting point? I started at A, so I'm back at A, so my displacement is actually zero meters. All right? So displacement depends on where you start and where you end. You actually don't care about anything else in between. It's the beginning and the end, and that's all we care about for displacement. Distance, I want to know about everything. All right? So one last example of this would be, hey, where do you start each morning? Hopefully a bed. Okay, hopefully you're starting in a bed. Where do you end up each day? Probably back in your bed. So what's your displacement all day during a whole day of school? The answer would be zero. You start and end in the same spot. What would your distance be? That could be, you know, four, five, six, seven miles, depending on how much you actually have to walk around everywhere, or obviously drive even more. Okay. So this picture with distance and displacement. What I'm trying to show is obviously the old George Jones. Now I can't believe I got to say old. All right. You basically have these people on opposite sides of the stadium. Okay. Let's choose these people right near the goalpost, these people down right by the goalpost. We would say they're both the same distance from the 50-yard line, but they would be different displacements based on the direction they are from the starting line, from the 50-yard uh, line. So that's, again, difference in distance and displacement. Okay? So again, distance is how far you travel. Displacement is how far an object is from its original point. All right? So again, I already mentioned this, does the odometer in your car measure distance or displacement? It measures di at distance, because it's not going to tell you left, right, up, and down. It doesn't go backwards when you go back home. Can you think of uh, a circumstance in which it measures both distance and displacement? There would only be one way. It would be where you set it for like trip A, trip B in your car, and what you do is you go straight line. That would be the only way. You have to go in a straight line the whole time then your distance and displacement is the same. If I start in the middle of the class and I take two steps to the left, my distance is two steps, my displacement is two steps to the left. So they're based, they are the same magnitude involved. All right. So here's a quick problem. All right. Two tennis players approach to congratulate uh, another after the game, find the distance and displacement of player A. Player A would go five meters to the right. That would be its displacement, and it, it had traveled five meters. B, two meters to the left, distance two meters. Okay? That is basically what we're looking at. The answer is obviously on the bottom there. Okay? Again, the big thing with this slide is we will show direction with a positive and a negative sign. Negative doesn't mean smaller. It does not mean smaller. The negative sign is just there saying you're going in the negative direction. All right, somebody that goes positive 3.5 and somebody that goes negative 3.5 travel the same distance, just in opposite directions. Okay, and as it says down here, we do this arbitrarily, meaning you get to pick in the problem. 
If it's not defined, some problems will say, consider positive as going to the right. That means positive has to be right, negative has to be left. It has to be. If it doesn't give it to you in the problem, you get to pick. You get to pick. All right, that's basically what you're looking at for these. All right, and this is a big, this is a good question. This is a good, uh, pr um, it's a tough question, kind of thinking. If we say delta d is the displacement and d is the distance, okay, that travels during that displacement, which of the following is always a true statement about distance and displacement? All right, the answer is. D. It is D. The distance is always greater than or equal to the magnitude, the absolute value of the displacement. Again, we don't we don't care about the negative positive signs. Okay? Why does the distance always have to be greater than or equal to? Why can't the displacement ever be greater? That's because, again, as we go one direction, okay, if I travel five meters, both the distance and displacement are five meters. But if I come back, let's say I come back three meters, my distance goes up to eight meters. But my displacement is how far I, where I started to where I now am. And so therefore I actually subtract three and now my displacement from my starting point is only two meters. So, my displacement and distance can be equal if I go one direction, but once I make a turn, the distance is, becomes larger than the displacement. Once you start turning a little bit, the distance becomes larger than the displacement. All right? Always, always, always. And it's because distance is additive, displacement depends on which way you're going. All right? So here's a question we always like to do. You're racing around the track. Track is 1.454 miles after you have driven around. Uh, I just can't see it. Sorry. After you've driven around one time, two times, two and a half times. How far have you driven, and what is your displacement? Okay. Um, now I'm going to cheat a little bit on this. Okay. Basically, what we're saying is, actually, I'm going to change the problem. I'm going to change the problem up on all of us. Let's say I've driven around two times. Let's get rid of that half. Okay? So let's say I start here. I go around one time. What would be my distance? I've traveled 1.54 miles. What would be my displacement? My displacement would be zero. I'm back at the starting point. So even though I've gone all the way around, I've only I basically haven't moved. I mean the idea is I'm back where I started. Alright? If I go around again. Basically add another 1.54 miles, but what's my displacement? Again, zero. Still just zero. So if you return to where you began, it is always, always zero displacement. That's a two and a half. Alright. What's the cost of the uh, displacement of a cross country team to begin at school, run ten miles and finish back at school? The answer is zero miles. Okay. So again, it just depends on where you begin and end. Alright? So I'm gonna stop this particular video just so we don't go too long and you're gonna you'll probably start up with the speed very soon.